cell phone, my ring. Morning light is coming through the shutters and I'm tangled in the green blanket on the couch, trying to get the phone out of my pocket. Hello? Hello, sweetheart. How are you doing there? Hi, dad. I'm fine. Are you coming? I'm already in New York. Be at Penn Station in about an hour. I wanted to call last night, but your mama said you'd be in bed early after such a hard day. I'd, how'd everything go with the police and everything? It was okay. After about two hours, everybody left except Robert. He's a friend from music camp at Tanglewood last summer. He's in the city for auditions, same as me. And I didn't want to be alone. Uncle Hank was here for a while too, so he knows about grandpa. And mama was right. I fell asleep on the couch around eight o'clock. I tell dad about the meeting at the police station in the afternoon. And then he has to go on his train, get on his train. See you soon, Gwenny. Grandpa's bedroom door is shut and I'm thinking Robert is still asleep. Daylight makes the house more cheerful, so I walk downstairs to my room. After I shower and dress, I go back upstairs and there's a note from Robert. Have to run errands, be back. Be back about noon, practice, Robert. I know it's good advice to practice and before, no one would have needed to remind me, but I can't. Dad's coming and the place needs to be tidied up. Robert did load the dirty dishes into the dishwasher, but he cleans up the way my big brothers do. The kitchen and dining area are still a mess. I start to open all the shutters and then I remembered William. For all I know, he's right outside trying to see into the house. It's a bad feeling and I leave the windows covered. Why do we think she has a bad feeling about William? Does anyone remember what type of person was William based on the things he told us from the last chapter? Does William seem like he's someone that would be friendly, that we would want to be friends with? Or is William the type of person we have to be careful around? Be, for be careful. Uh-huh. Yeah, we have to be careful around William because he kind of described his life in the last chapter. And in describing his life, he told us about doing certain things like taking items from people who were bad, like Robin Hood. So he would steal from people, but he never said what he did with the items that he stole. And he kind of liked the way he was living his life being invisible, okay? So you are right, Miss Luna. William is someone we have to be careful around. After I finish the dishes, I walk to the table, pick up the chair William sat on and put it over in a corner. I don't want to use that chair again. It should probably be reupholstered or burnt. Then I move the dandelions back to the center of the table and they're still as bright and fresh as ever, tossing their heads and sp in a spring sp sprightly dance. Thank you, Mr. Woodsworth. Robert's back a few minutes before my dad arrives and I'm glad because I want my dad to meet him. But as the front buzzer sounds, Robert smiles at me and then disappears down the stairs with his trumpet. Hey, there she is. In the middle of my dad's bear hug, I remember how much I love my family. Family, Remember how much it means to have that love, always there. But even during this sweet moment in the doorway, at least half my mind is watching on high alert making sure there's not room for someone to slip past us into the house. The William thing is making me completely paranoid. Robert made me promise not to tell my dad or anyone else about that situation. But there are plenty of other things to talk about, and we do. For almost an hour, and during that time, neither of us say anything about Grandpa. 
And as we talk, my dad does a good job of hiding how sad he is that his own dad is gone now. But I can still tell he's torn about it because I know how I would feel. When Robert comes back upstairs, right away, my dad grabs his hand and says, I want to thank you for taking care of my little girl last night. Means a lot to me. Robert's sort of embarrassed, but he smiles back and says, sure, no problem. I mean, it's not like she wasn't doing great on her own, but I was glad to be here. So, dad says, what'd you think gonna happen at the meeting at the police? Got any clues? It's hard to remember that my dad grew up in Queens. His accent sounds like pure West Virginia, which I think is actually much nicer. I shrug. There's that letter. There's that letter grandpa sent to his lawyer. That's got to be important, don't you think? Robert nods his head. Probably. Has to be important. My dad says, well, we're all going to know soon enough, I guess. And he's right about that. We have time to eat some soup and sandwiches and I get dad moved into grandpa's bedroom and the sheets all changed and everything. And then it's time to walk to Broadway and hail a cab for the ride to the police station. The 24th precinct station is on 100th street next to a playground in the middle of the block. It's also close to an apartment complex called Frederick Douglass Houses more than a dozen buildings that fit, fill most of the area between 100th and 104th Street. West Side High School is close too. And I get a quick look at the public school I'd attend if I actually lived around here. And if I didn't have a scholarship at Lantham Academy. And if my family and my grandpa hadn't helped me become a classical musician, so many ifs. Mr. Grant is already inside the station waiting for us. And shortly after Detective Keenan takes us up a short flight of stairs to a conference room, Uncle Hank walks in. Me and my dad have a quick hug. Excuse me, he and my dad have a quick hug. Both men are generally happy to see each other. With a big smile, still holding my dad at arm's length, he says, I don't think I've seen you since summer before you went into the army. My dad nods and says, that was a real camping trip. Great memories. Great memories. And my prescription, excuse me, perception of Uncle Hank, excuse me, shifts again because I can see how narrow a view he'd had of a man. He really is someone's uncle and someone else's little brother. I'm sorry, it took something like this to make me figure that out. Because remember, in the beginning of the story, the way Uncle Hank treated Grandpa gave Gwen a certain view of her uncle. She saw her uncle in a different manner because every time he came around, Uncle Hank and Grandpa constantly argued and fought. So because of their interactions, she had this idea in her head about the type of uncle that he was. Well, because of this unforeseen situation and grandpa's passing, she sees her uncle in a different light. So he's no longer this mean, overbearing little brother who's trying to be bossy or trying to control her grandfather. He's actually someone's uncle. He actually loves and cares about his family. And she did not see that before because of how he always came around. And sometimes that happens with certain family members. If you have certain family members that every time they come around, they may be mean or there's constantly a fight or an argument the people around may have a different view of that person because in reality, they do not get to see another side of them, only that one side, the mean side. So this is an opportunity for her to actually see another side of Uncle Hank that she had never seen before, okay? So here we are. I look around the room and that's when I notice it's got one of those mirrored glass walls 
and right away I get the feeling I'm being watched. The detective takes charge, pointing at chairs for everyone, including a court um, stenographer, and that's the person that sits here and kind of types up information, who moves to a corner, faces us, sets up a portable keyboard, and then nods at the officer. Okay. First, let's see this letter you bought, Mr. Grant, and everyone please speak clearly for the stenographer. So if you've ever watched court shows or TV shows where they are in a courtroom, they have a man or a woman, usually a woman, sitting at a little desk and they're typing. And what they are doing is typing the conversation that is taking place in the room. So they're having it on record, what is being said by who? One second. Okay, no problem, Ms. Luz. I'll send you the recording. Okay, I'll see you next week. I'll watch the video tomorrow. you okay. send to me. Yes, thank I will. you. Thank okay, you. bye. I hope the baby feels better. <laughs> okay, bye. The lawyer reaches for his briefcase, pulls out a tan envelope, and passes it to the detective who is sitting across the table. Detective Keenan says, I am examining the postmark, which is Thursday of last week. This is a stamped and sealed registered mail envelope, and it has not been opened since received at the office of Kenneth Grant, attorney at law. He passes the envelope back to Mr. Grant. Mr. Grant will now open the envelope in clear view and will determine together if any of the contents are relevant in the case at hand, that being the suspicious death of Lawrence Page, former resident of West 109th Street, New York City. So um, the detective is saying all of this and a stenographer stenographer that's how you say it stenographer is typing the information on her keyboard okay and what happens is this information or the dialogue or conversation is being recorded so if they ever have to go back and review the information it's all typed out who said what that's pretty much what they're doing okay the lawyer tears open the envelope, flaps and pulls out three smaller sealed envelopes. Mr. Grant says there are three standard 10, excuse me, there are three standard number 10 envelopes. Each here, excuse me, each sealed. One is addressed to me, Kenneth Grant. One is addressed to Henry Page, care of Keith Grant. And the third is addressed to Gwendolyn Page, also care of Kenneth Grant. And now I'm opening the envelope addressed to me. So here, and I don't think I have a letter here. They have this envelope. It is addressed to three people. The attorney, there's one for the attorney. I'm assuming that Henry, Henry Grant is Uncle Hank and then Gwendolyn. So there are three letters that grandpa wrote for the family. Okay, so the lawyer is going to read the first letter addressed to him. He does, and he takes out two handwritten pages and reads them each silently. No one is talking. So the stenographer fingers are still looking around the table. I'm the only one not trying to read the lawyer's face, except Robert. He seems uncomfortable, and he's glancing around the conference room. Maybe the two-way mirror makes him jumpy. Then Robert notices I'm looking his way and he flashes me a tense smile. Clearing his throat, Mr. Grant passes the letter to the detective and says, after you take a look at this, if there are no objections, I'd read each page aloud on record. While this includes some personal business of the deceased, I believe it is relevant to those these circumstances. So Mr. Grant is basically saying, he's telling the detective, I want you to read it first. And if you don't have a problem with what's here, I'm going to read the letter out loud to everyone. Detective Keenan scans the pages, says, I agree with that, and hands the letter back. Mr. Grant says, for the record, I am reading from a handwritten page 
And I am confident that the handwriting can be proven but beyond all doubt to be that of my client, Lawrence Page. He adjusts his glasses and begins first reading the date at the top of the page. I am Lawrence Page and I am writing this of my own free will sitting alone in my own home. Whoever's reading this knows that I am gone now. I want anybody who's concerned and I'm sure what's a number of people, that's a number of people to know one thing for certain, no one but me had any part in getting me into the freezer chest that's located on the ground floor of this home. So he's saying no one had any, no one had any part at putting him in the freezer. He put his own self in the freezer. That's what grandpa's telling everyone. So no one put him there. No one killed him. He put himself there. This was my idea. And I put myself there. I'm sorry for the way it looks. And I'm sorry for the fright it must have given someone when I was found. As I was writing this, I met that point in my life where I know what's going to happen next. And I don't want anybody but me to feel responsible for making decisions what to do or what not to do for me during my final days. So I have made my own decision. Folks might disagree with what I've done or the way I've done it. And I expect some will, but there it is. The people who know me and love me will understand. And they're the only ones I care about. Lawrence Daniel Page. So grandpa is telling them that no one hurt him, no one, harmed him he wanted to be in control of his own life he wanted to be in control of when he passed away okay my dad wipes a tear from the corner of his eye and uncle hank blows his nose into a handkerchief and i'm crying too i can hear grandpa's voice so clearly i don't really understand why he would do this but I know that I'm the one of the people he love who loves him. And grandpa says, I'll understand. So I will. And I hope I will. Detective Keenan pushes a box of tissues in my direction. And I take a few and say, thank you. Mr. Grant then takes the second page of the envelope. This, he says, is not technically relevant to this proceeding but I want to publish it onto the record of this inquiry so there's no doubt that it came from the same envelope and that it is written by the same person. And again, he begins to read aloud. So now Mr. Grant is reading page two of his letter. I am Lawrence Page and by my own hand, I am revising my last will and testament. When and if the property on 109th Street is sold, from the part of the proceedings that belongs to my estate, I want enough money to be set aside to pay the entire cost of tuition, room, and board for the college and postgraduate studies of my granddaughter, Gwendolyn Page. If that property is not sold, then the necessary money should be taken from other available assets in my estate. In addition, immediately upon my death, I want $35,000 taken from my personal funds and giving to the same Gwendolyn Page for the purchase of a violin and a violin bow of her choosing. So grandpa is saying when he's basically writing his will and he is saying when he passes away, he wants and they sell his house, he wants his money to, that he would get for his estate to be given to his granddaughter to pay for her to go to college and then to go off if she decides to study further. But he also says um, out of his bank account, he wants $3,500 to be taken to buy her her own violin and bow. Because remember, Gwen had a borrowed violin. She, the violin she played with was not hers. It belonged to someone else. They were loaning it to her. They were allowing her to borrow it, okay? I also want enough money to be provided from my funds of my estate so my granddaughter Gwendolyn Page can continue her musical studies here in New York without interruption until the end of the current school year. These three provisions will be administered by my attorney, 
Kenneth Grant as part of his duties as the executor of my estate. Mr. Grant looks up and says, and this codicil is signed by Lawrence Page and witnessed by Jason D. Renzo of the same address as the deceased. It's dated on the last day that my client was seen alive. So grandfather signed the note and he had the neighbor, Jason, sign the note as well. Robert is smiling and nodding at me and everyone looks pleased, even Uncle Hank. I am all weepy again, but what the lawyer said doesn't surprise me. Here's my grandpa an hour or two before he dies and he's thinking about someone else. It's beginning to fit. Looking at the detective, Mr. Grant says, shall I open and read these other letters? The detective shakes his head. I don't think that's necessary now. So Mr. Grant reaches to his left and then his right, handing out the remaining letters, one to Uncle Hank and the other to me. Uh oh The policeman says, you've got the preliminary coroner's report. And as of this moment, this case is pretty much closed. Mr. Grant raises his eyebrows, so it's suicide? And everyone else around the table winces at the word. Detective Keenan says, actually, no. Mr. Page took a small dozen, excuse me, a small oxygen bottle into the freezer with him. So he didn't suffocate. And he was all bundled up in his coat and cap and boots. So it wasn't the coal either. And he put a piece of duct tape over the freezer latch so he could have opened the lid and gotten out anytime he wanted to. The coroner is 95% certain that this man would have still passed on no matter where he'd been at the time of his death. He chose a strange place to lie down, but it's inaccurate to say that he died in his sleep. According to the coroner, Lawrence Page died of natural causes. Now, let me pause for a second and kind of explain that. So basically, grandfather, put himself in the freezer. He took an oxygen, and I'll have to pull that up. Um, give me one second. Wow. He pulled, he had an oxygen mask over his face. Oxygen tank. So he took an oxygen tank with him, had it over his mouth and he's breathing in it. He has on a big coat and he even put tape over the latch so he could actually get out because what would have happened, most um, policies, uh, life insurance policies, if you commit suicide, so if you kill yourself, your family does not get any of the money. Does that make sense? So grandfather, he was smart enough to know that if he took his own life, Gwen would not get any of the money, okay? But he was smart enough to know that it, his time was coming near. He knew that he was going to pay, you know, probably knew he wasn't gonna last much longer. So he laid in the freezer, and he ended up passing anyway of natural causes. So because he passes away from natural causes, his family will still get money from his passing away. Okay, so grandpa was very, 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 very smart. Very smart. Okay, really quickly, let's do a new share. So this is kind of an idea uh images of what grandpa may have looked like let's take this guy right here so i'm going to show you an image here as it pulls up of a guy with an oxygen mask and okay, that picture's not coming up okay so here is a lady share screen with an oxygen mask on her face so that's kind of what grandpa had in the freezer. Because remember, this is a huge freezer. It's one of those big freezers people have in their garages and you fill it up with food. 
it's big enough for someone to get in it and lay down. That's that's where grandpa was. Um, let me show you a picture of the of what the freezer may have looked like. Um, so it's one of it's a it's a big freezer. I guess it's not gonna pull up. Here we go. So it's a it's a it's a big freezer. So this is the type of freezer grandpa was laying in when um he passed away. Okay, so let's go back. All right. So he dies from natural causes. Standing up abruptly, the detective walks to the door. Sorry to rush everybody along, but I've got to ask you to leave now. We'll be in touch as needed. And then the detective stands there, one hand on the doorknob as the group files out of the room. I'm the last one out, but I'm expecting the detective to follow me, but he doesn't. He slams the door shut on my heels and then three other non-uniform officers in the hallway line up at the door, knock once and slip back into the conference room. One of the three men has a big old video camera. Before Daddy, Robert, and I are more than 20 feet away, I hear shouting from the room, then the sound of furniture banging around. I hesitate and look back, but Robert says, come on, just keep going. That's got nothing to do with us. But I stop, and then Robert does too, and I look at him because it sounds like he's afraid. Then from behind the closed door of the conference room, someone yells, Get your bloody hands off of me. It's a man's voice. And he has a British accent. My heart stopped and I gasped. Isn't that? So after they walk out of the, the room, I can't think of what it's called, the room in the uh, police pre precinct where they're being questioned, um, they walk in the room. And apparently someone else is in there or because she says she saw ununiformed police officers going in the room. So when they go in the room, they hear this fight. This is the same room that they just came out of. Okay. So it's almost like a room, an interrogation room. That's what it's called. Couldn't think of it. <laughs> So here is the type of room that they were in, okay? So it probably had enough chairs for everybody to sit. And remember, there's this mirror that's there where on one side, all you see is a mirror. And on the other side, you can look into the room. So as they walk out of this room, the police officer and three other men come in the room and this fight breaks out. So as they're walking out, Gwen hears this from behind, but she also hears the British accent, okay? And if we remember who had the British accent, the invisible guy, William, okay? But Robert shakes his head and makes a stern face at me. Let's just go, okay? The others are already outside. So we go down the stairs and out of the police station. And then we hurry to catch up with my dad and Uncle Hank. Mr. Grant is already in a cab and he turns and waves at me out the window and I smile and I wave back. Then we're walking beside Uncle Hank and daddy. And I start to say something to Robert, but he whispers, not now. As we cross Amsterdam Avenue and go downhill toward Broadway, I'm left with my own thoughts. And I'm thinking that I didn't believe what Robert said. That the commotion in the conference room has nothing to do with us because I'm sure Robert's involved in this right up to this dark brown eyebrows. And that means I'm involved too, even if I don't want to be. Chapter 16. My dad makes us all, takes us all to a steakhouse for an early supper. So it's over an hour before I get to talk to Robert alone. The meal feels awkward. 
There's only one thing on our minds, but none of us want to talk about what grandpa did or how the investigation turned out. Even though it was it was a close to a happy ending as anyone could expect. And those generous gifts to me are almost embarrassing. I feel like I've been picked as the favorite, grandpa's little pet. Even so, I can tell that the others are all happy for me. Uncle Hank included. Three times during the meal, my eyes fill up with tears, thinking how sweet grandpa is to take such good care of me. Then Hank and daddy start telling stories about growing up in Queens with grandpa and grandmother, about trips to the Bronx Zoo in Coney Island and Jones Beach. And before long, all four of us are laughing. And just when I'm starting to feel happy, my dad says, I called Veteran Affairs before I left home. And since he's a decorated officer, they're gonna send us a color guard and a bulger, bugler, and they'll have a presentation flag too. He'd want to have that, Hank. And the two men started talking about all the arrangement for grandpa's funeral. So I say, if it's okay, Robert and I are going to walk back to grandpa's. My dad said, sure, sweetheart, but I'd rather you took a calf, I make a face. Dad, I'm a city kid, remember? Besides, it's not even dark yet. He pushes a $20 bill into my hand, then, here, take some money anyway and stop for a treat somewhere. You're pulling out before dessert. Robert thanks daddy for the meal and then we're outside. Before we're 30 feet from the restaurant, someone calls out, Gwenny, I know that voice. It's Uncle Hank. Robert says, I'll wait here for you. I walk back and when I stand in front of him, he talks fast like he has got to get it all out in one breath. I feel bad the way I acted and about what happened. I wanted you to know that. Said some mean things too. I can't undo anything, but I wanted you to know. The fuel costs hit me, that's all. Couldn't even pay my drivers last week. I just, I just, it, it, excuse me. This is hard for him. He's looking down into my face. It's okay, Uncle Hank. And what happened? It wasn't your fault. I know grandpa didn't blame you. He even told me not to judge you. And I don't. I think everyone's going to be all right. Don't you? Because that's what I hope. He nods awkwardly, smiles a little. Well, got to get back inside. See you soon, Gwenny. Bye, Uncle Hank. I've been thinking of questions to ask Robert all during dinner, but we walk north on Broadway without talking. I just been given a brand new portrait of my uncle Hank and I need to let that paint dry a little. But after 10 seconds, my curiosity won't be still. So that was William in the police station, right? And you went to the police and turned him in, right? Was that your errand this morning? Robert's got his hand stuffed in his jacket pockets. He slips me a sideways glance and a, and a half smile. I also made an important stop at the Italian bakery. I ignore his attempt at humor because it isn't funny, none of it. But why did you think William would be at the police station? Robert shrugs. Well, for starters, he told us yesterday, yesterday that he would be very interested to see how the case turned out. You remember that? I nod and Robert says, and he also bragged about what a hot shot snooper he is. But most of all, I was pretty sure William would come there to contact me again. I didn't think I fooled him last night at all. He knows that I know a lot more than I told him. And two years ago, I can remember how completely desperate I was to find out anything, to follow up any clue, even a tiny one, if it might mean I could get back my, get back my life back. And as far as William is concerned, I am, I am a huge clue, a real break. He could have hung around the house and wa wa watched for me, but it's February and it's cold out here. But he knew that I had to be at the police station at 3 p.m. today. So was I sure he'd showed up? Nope. But I'd have to bet my trumpet that he would, and he did. So what did you tell the detective? 
So what Robert is telling her is Mr. William gave her, gave them all of these clues that he would probably be following them only to see if Robert was going to tell him any more information. So Robert went to the police station to tell the detective about William so he can no longer keep following him. So he's going to tell Gwen what he told the detective. So what did you tell the detective? Ah, uh, Robert says, that was an artistic part to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, but not quite the whole truth. I told Detective Keenan that there was this crazy guy who had slipped into your grandpa's house yesterday during all the confusion and that he was hiding in the study when everyone was giving their statements. I nod. So far true. Robert ignores my commentary. And I then told the detective that this crazy guy talked to us after everyone left and that he said he was dying to know how the case would turn out. Also completely true. And then I told him that this man said he'd figure out a way to avoid the most sophisticated security systems and that he'd been acting like a regular Robin Hood at some of the high of the richest stores in Manhattan. So that's not quite the truth, I say. Close enough. And then I said, it's almost like this guy thinks he's invisible or something, which would make somebody with great, excuse me, which would make somebody into a pretty great thief. No, you said that? Robert grins. Sure did, because that's the big bait. Catching a broad daylight robber would do a lot for a detective's career. And I also gave him William's juice glass from the dinner dishes last night so he could match fingerprints from the crime scene because he had to leave fingerprints all over town. Invisible robbers can't wear gloves. And standing there with my mouth open, it dawns on me just how far out of my league Robert is. The guy's a pop, pop, pop um, plotter. But I want to know the rest. So what'd he say when you said that stuff about he thinks he's invisible? Well, the detective took this long pause, like a count to 10, because now he's not sure, not so sure about me. And he said, so you think he might try to hang around the meeting this afternoon, right at the police station? And I say, this man seems to think he can get away with anything. Also true, and also great bait for a detective. Then this was the clowning, crowning touch. I said, if he's so good at hiding himself, I think an in-frame camera would probably make him show up plain as day. Excuse me, an infrared camera. So an infrared camera is a type of camera, is a type of camera that um, sees your, um, it sees what's there by heat images. So let me show you. Uh, this is a good image. So this is, let me make it larger. This is an infrared camera. So you see how you see this woman there? An infrared camera can detect that someone is there by the heat in their body, okay? So if William is invisible and they have this camera pointing in the door as people come in, even though he's invisible, the camera will pick up his body heat to show them that there is a person standing there. So that's how the detectives knew when William came in the police station. Very smart. All right, let's finish up. Okay. Um, I think an infrared camera would probably make him show up plain as day. Okay. Oh, hold on, guys. I'm sorry. Oh, I went back too far. Okay. Robert, I stopped short on the sidewalk and he faces me beaming. And that and that's what they did. They lit up their camera and they tracked his body heat right there in the room after we left. And it was four guys to one. So I'm thinking William the Invisible Creep is in jail right now. 
I reach out, reach into my shoulder bag and pull out my cell phone. Call him. Robert looks at me like I'm insane. I mean, Detective Keenan, call him right now. I want to know, to really know that that man isn't walking around my neighborhood tonight because if he's still on the loose and he wants to find you, he's going to come to grandma's, grandpa's house again. And I don't want that to happen. Or if it might happen, then I want to be prepared. So call, okay, for me. Robert takes the phone and calls 411 to get the non-emergency number of the 24th precinct. Hello? Could I talk to Detective Keenan? It's Robert Phillips calling. Robert nods to me and whispers, he's there. Detective, this is Robert. I talked about that crazy guy, remember? I just want to know if you got him. Oh, that's too bad. Robert shoots me a glance and I grasp and grab his arm. He pulls loose and keeps talking. But I really called before, excuse me, but I really called before, remembered something else he told me yesterday. He said that he had an apartment north on 14th Street, a first floor walk up above an old meatpacking plant. Right, with an electric keypad instead of a lock. Right. So I thought you should know about that. Well, anyway, good luck. And Robert hangs up. I'm frantic and my voice has gone up an octave. They didn't get him? Robert, that's really bad. It's terrible because he's not stupid and he knows the police were looking out for him and, and nobody could have told him but you or me. So now, now he knows that one of us tried to turn him in and he'll try to do something. He'll, Robert waves his hand at me. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Calm down. The detective was lying to me. I'm sure they got him. No doubt at all. So just relax. I'm stunned. Lying? What do you mean? He's a policeman. Why would he lie? Police do, don't do that. Right, says Robert, unless it's in the in interest of the public safety. If the police have a photo of a dangerous suspect, but the suspect doesn't know that, do they go on TV and say, we have no information at this time? Yes, they do, because that lie makes the suspect think he can walk around freely, and then the police can spot him and arrest him. Do you think that detective who's got an invisible man in his custody is going to tell people about it? Even me? No way. And about the rest of it, whether William tells him about me being invisible and all that, I don't know what's going to come out of that. But for now, I think the police are going to keep a tight lid on this, or maybe they'll make William an officer, offer he can't refuse, make him go to work for them. Who knows? Anyway, I'm sure it was right to get him off the streets. So we've done our civic duty and we'll have to see how all of the rest of it works out because that's not our job. So where's the ice cream in the city? In this city? How Robert can think about ice cream right now is beyond my understanding. Of course, I've been on such an emotional seesaw today that everything is beyond my understanding. But Robert turns on his ice cream radar, which guides us across 105th Street, where we find a sweets shop that's actually selling waffle cones in February. And he orders us orders for both of us two massive cones with three scoops each, whipped cream, nuts, sprinkles, the works. Then by carefully decorating his nose with an assortment of toppings, Robert finally gets me to smile. Even though I'm having a little fun, and even though I'm grateful for the good things that have happened today, I'm still uneasy about the Williams situation. And always, always, I feel this sadness that won't go away because I can't stop thinking about my grandpa and that big freezer, about what he did. And the selfish part of me is still wishing that all of the comp excuse me, complications would vanish because I want to get my story back my story. I just want to be a musician and suddenly I know why. It's because I've been imagining that it's going to be easy. It's because I think I'll be able to lose myself in great sweeps of harmony and the all-knowing infallible conductor 
will always lead the way and me. I imagine myself gliding seamlessly from one movement to the next with hardly a rus rustle as I turn the pages of the score because I want things to work out the way they do when Botch is in charge or Piaget or Jane Austen or even Yates because I'm desperate for a nice tidy ending maybe with a pleasant rhyme or two or that wonderful last burst of symphonic harmony that makes me want to shout, yes, but it's not happening that way.